Lee Ping, you, oh, we got it. Okay, so uh, Craig Watts here, Utah Manor Families. So excited to welcome all the parents tonight. Um, we've got uh, two amazing speakers, the heads of the program. So first we'll hear from Stacy Lyon, who heads the program, and she can explain more. I'm still understanding myself, but basically from first until ninth grade in the AP test, from what I understand. And then we have Gao Laosher, who is over the bridge program, and she'll speak beginning at eight o'clock. So basically from uh, 7 to 8 p.m. We'll be talking mostly about first through ninth grade up through the AP test with Stacy, And then from 8 to 9 p.m. we'll be talking with Galauscher. And just a huge thanks to Stacy and Galauscher for making time on a weeknight when I know there's a ton of other things going on. I know there's like three or four camps going on. We've got more things coming up. And so just really appreciate um, you being here and having a a chance to be able to ask questions and, and be able to understand more about the program. Parents have kids at all different levels and some parents will have four or five kids in the program that are currently at all different levels. And so it's a great opportunity to get the whole picture from first through graduation. The other thing just to mention, which I think a lot of people here understand is that the first cohort of students are now seniors in high school. And so we've got the full first through 12th um, in schools right now. And so it's a lot to cover, um, but it's really important for us as parents to kind of understand what the program is, how it works and how we can support because, you know, not being native Chinese speakers, it's a challenge, but I think we have a lot of resources that we can bring to the table. And that might be something we can discuss a little bit further. So I'll just turn the time over to Stacy, and um, I'll be monitoring the chat with Li Ping. And we'll, if you have questions, type them in the chat and then we'll We'll break to the questions when we get some breaks in the presentation. So thanks all for coming and we'll turn the time over to Stacy. Thanks so much, Stacy. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, can you all see this screen? Or, uh, okay, one person can, then we're great. All right, um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives with kids um, and everything else that goes along with that to join us and in supporting the Chinese Immersion Program. I know that this program would not work if it were not for parents. And I am so glad uh, to have Craig leading this effort to get our parents uh, organized a little more. I really appreciate the opportunity to have face-to-face -face communication with you and uh, be able to have a channel where I can share information and get feedback from you as well. So really pleased to be able to join you. In case you did not know, we do have a website. It's listed here on the slide, utahchinesedli.org. Um, that's where it's sort of our program central place where you can find information about things that are going on. So in case you had not uh, come across that or seen it, I uh, wanted you to be aware of that. So I, I met with Craig as he was getting this organization going. Um, and I said, this, this is, you know, we're now moving into the phase with our first cohort of students uh, in 12th grade and ready to graduate, where I feel like it's, you know, we are shifting gears now that we were, we were in our last, uh, we've done this first cohort of 12 years. And so I said, this is Utah DLI meets the world. It's time for us to really focus uh, not just on our classroom, but on the things outside of the classroom that are gonna make our classroom experience more meaningful for our students. I mean, you don't just sit in a classroom for 12 years and, and never have a chance to interact with people from the country that you're learning the language about. And so it's always been a priority for me to find opportunities for our students to interact and to have the chance to go to, um, however that might come about, to Chinese speaking countries, China, obviously, Taiwan um, are the two places uh, that are the you know, most commonly um, brought into the picture for that kind of thing. So tonight we do have a special guest that I would like to introduce um, from China. Um, just a little background first. Um, in February, we held a middle school camp uh, featuring Shaolin Kung Fu, Shaolin Kung Fu, um, and the head of that camp, the director, is Zhao Laoshi. Um, he's a um, top-notch performer of Shaolin martial arts. He's won medals, gold medals, traveled the world with the highest officials of China, representing China and other countries. 
And we're very honored to have him collaborate with us with this camp. Uh, and so this was in February and we had such a big response to that. And we also had a lot of elementary parents uh, reach out and want to be a part of that. So we're looking at doing a camp this summer. And uh, Jalal Shirt, would you like to introduce yourself? Let's welcome you to our group. Okay. Uh, Hi everybody. Yeah. Glad to see everyone. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I come from uh, uh, Henan, uh, Shaolin Temple. Yeah. I really enjoy communicating with all the kids, uh, share the Chinese Kung Fu. Uh, we will plan yeah, uh, uh, more share to the Chinese Kung Fu culture. I hope uh, the Kung Fu can bring the healthy and happiness for all the uh, uh, kids all the children, I hope you can enjoy that. I hope more chance um, to share the, the beautiful culture with everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Zhao Shi. Should do my salute. <laughs> uh, yes, we had a wonderful time in the February camp. And in the chat box, I put a link to a five question Google form survey about logistics. Um, we just wanted to get some parent feedback um, in regards with regards to time commitments and such. If we were to offer a Kung Fu camp. So, um, so that would be led again by Zha Lao Shi. Um, currently, just so you know, things that have been happening real quickly. Um, currently, we have three camps going on for our middle and high school students with three different universities in um, China. Uh, one of them is an AP focused, one is a culture one uh, for bridge level students, and the other is for Chinese one and two students, not just immersion. And then coming up in April, uh, we have a camp for fifth and sixth graders that's connected directly to their curriculum where they learn about the city Chengdu uh, in China, and that's where pandas are from, in case you didn't know, it's the big panda city. Uh, so that is um, on deck as well. And in all of these cases, they have the opportunities to connect with students in China. So we're really excited about these and we have a lot more um, coming up. Um, in just a minute, I'll be joined uh, by Jill Landis Lee. Um, as, as Craig mentioned, uh, as far as division of responsibility in the state, I'm actually over the K-12 program all the way uh, from grade one to 12. We don't have kindergarten. I'm sure you're all aware. It's only half day. There's not enough time uh, to get Chinese in there. However, the uh, high school piece, the bridge program is not administered through the State Board of Education. It's administered through the uh, University of Utah's Second Language Acquisition Center. So um, Jill Landis Lee is the director for Bridge and in a minute she'll speak to us with a little bit more about that. Um, and then uh, Gal Alsher will, will also um, do the second hour as Craig mentioned. I just wanted to bring up- uh -huh. Basically, can I interrupt just a minute? So sure. people didn't, some people didn't get the link to the survey. Is it possible to repost it? Because if they came in a little later, they wouldn't be able to scroll back on the history. So if oh, there's a way to copy yeah. that, and repaste it into the chat that people would be able to do the survey that you mentioned. All right. I will Sorry to interrupt. Is it? I will try to do that when I don't share my. I'll do that at the end. How about that? Okay, right? sure. No problem at all. Just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I, I knew that would happen. <laughs> okay, should have saved a different place. Um, I just wanted to bring up real quickly here because we know here in our country we're facing a lot of uh, attention on uh, Asian Americas and uh, Asian Americans and other uh, groups that have faced a lot of um, issues in terms of equity and all sorts of things of that nature. And this statement by the National Council of State Supervisors for Languages, I think speaks to our program and really what we're about. I just wanted to start with a few vision um, things to share with you about why we have this program. And in this statement, I really particularly liked this point about the development of intercultural awareness and 
competence, not just awareness, but competence, meaning we know how to interact in a culture appropriately. And secondly, just this call for all of us to look beneath the surface of the culture. And what your children are involved in right now um, is so exciting to me to think that in, in the future days, we're going to have uh, political leaders and business leaders who can really connect with the Chinese culture in a way that nobody has ever been able to do before and to be able to engage with them because they can get inside the culture. And if you think about it every single day that your kids go to class, they are negotiating meaning with their Chinese teachers, particularly if they're of native descent. There are so many experiences that your children have already had in the classroom informally through their communications with their teachers that teach them so much about, about communicating in Chinese culture and those expectations. So initially John Huntsman was the, uh, Governor Huntsman was the person behind uh, getting, issuing this challenge in our state for um, language study. And his point here is that if you, um, you've missed the point um, and you've missed our time and place in the world today, if you don't understand the importance of being a multicultural person, as he put it being able to communicate in another language. And that led to, um, back in 2008, I want to make be clear about the funding for our program. I know there's been a lot of information in the news uh, about funding and where schools might be getting funding for our program. Our, our program is funded 100% through the Utah State Legislature. And every year the budget comes up and so um, it's uh, something that we have to uh, lobby for and prepare for. So when it comes time again uh, next year, uh, we hope to um, have more uh, people uh, participate in that. We have funded the program initially at $100 per student. Right now it's about down to 69. And so uh, we are putting together strategies next year to hopefully be able to get that back up to the level that we need it to. But all of the funding, just be clear, comes through our state legislature. So back in 2009, the quote from John Huntsman was given at a, uh, what was called a, a world language summit. Uh, and they brought together from Utah, they brought together business and education leaders and government leaders all together in a big summit to talk about the future of Utah and what the needs were economically for our state to be able to succeed. What came out of that was what was called a world language roadmap. And I can provide you with the link to that and at a different time, Greg, if you wanna put that up there. This is what I would like to see revisited as we move forward, because for us to really help our students prepare for the future, they go to the bridge program, they go to university and where they're going to take their language and what they need to do with it is to is out in our community and so these conversations uh, need to be revived again i feel for us to really take things to the next level uh, this slide is just uh, governor herbert's uh, endorsement for and for uh, world languages in utah and how critical they are to our success at that time uh, of the summit, uh, the businesses uh, here in Utah shared all of the challenges and how many millions of dollars that they lost because they did not have uh, the, the personnel that had language and culture proficiency. So because they didn't understand the culture, uh, they made many mistakes, lost lots of money, and so, you know, this was one of the things that was part of that conversation. Well, our kids haven't hit the market yet, but they're getting close. Uh, but this was exciting to see uh, last week, uh, just that Utah's economy in the US is ranked number one and our education is ranked number three. So for me, I feel like, and we all know how business um, in Utah has, how Utah has attracted so many international businesses. 
So as a program and as a leader of this program, um, it's really my hope, my desire that we can continue to build our connections within our local community so that our students don't need to wait until they graduate, but early on in junior high and in high school, they have opportunities for internships and ways to interact in our community that will really uh, take their language out of the classroom. So uh, what I tell our teachers is that we're building a world-class program. What's world-class? It's, you know, we have the highest standards we need to shoot for the highest standards and we need to hold our teachers to the highest standards um, in what's happening in the classroom. So just to share with you where we are, we started with six schools, um, six schools. So probably around 200 students. Um, I don't have the exact numbers from the first year, but on this chart, you can see currently where we are. We have a total of 83, uh, 83 schools and 18,137 students. And as you can see every year, we're adding around 1,700 students to the program as they go up. And those first uh, two or three years as we built, we built up very, very quickly. Um, and we've maintained that momentum all the way through. In fact, to the point uh, that we had to freeze um, our elementary school growth um, at, at what it is 32 right now. So we could, we could manage the secondary as we began to expand. Uh, so just a simple graphic here, uh, which you all probably have seen before in other meetings. Um, when we are in elementary, we're able to teach subjects. We have the perfect 50-50 model where we have math and science, as you all know. Seventh and eighth grade, we, we call that the continuation because we cannot keep that 50-50 model. Um, and then ninth grade is focused um, on the AP language and culture type of content and preparing the students to enter university level study. So is Jill here? Speak now or forever hold your peace, Jill. <laughs> okay. If she shows up, we'll come back to her because it's got all she's she not here. Okay. Do you want maybe you can check and make sure she's got the right link? Um, oh, okay. And that I'll way that if she comes later, we'll pop back to her. Okay. Um, the, key, the key part on this slide is, that we really want to emphasize is that we have a K-16 vision for this program. Um, it's not intended to, okay, you go to high school and then what? Um, so the bridge program that Gal Alshir will be talking about will explain a little more about how we prepare in our students to connect up with that, uh, with that program. Uh, yes, please feel free if there's certain questions, uh, Craig, to jump in or whatever. I just want, just because I get a lot of questions and people aren't always sure how things work, I thought I'd just share the org chart here, um, how the program is set up. Uh, on this chart, uh, there's uh, Mr. Carl Bowman is the person over all the world languages in the state. Um, each of the languages, uh, we have six languages, uh, Chinese, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, and Russian. Chinese is the yellow. Uh, so here I am uh, with my team of four. And uh, each of the languages has a team. What does that team do? Uh, we're here um, to support each of the schools, each of the schools your children are in, we're to support the principals in implementing the program and support each district. So we're here, we identify the curriculum, uh, we set the standards, and then we support. We don't do the hiring, uh, that's done by your principals. Um, we do the training for your teachers, we work with the English partner teachers as well. So uh, we are in close communication with all of those people. Just so you know, we have um, very close relationships with them and trying to help them support uh, 
the teachers to support your kids. So um, I, this is just a sort of a reiteration of what we just saw in terms of numbers and, and students and school districts. And I know that you've got a map on the website, Craig, with, with those as well. Um, but this is um, this, the scale of this program, just uh, for perspective, it, it, there's no other program like this in the country. So as far as Chinese immersion goes, we have the largest scale program. Um, and there is only one other state uh, that has a state administered uh, immersion program. So, and that's the state of Delaware. Um, not quite as large as Utah, <laughs> not that we're even large. Um, but to be able to have that level of support um, is a big uh, bonus for us. And as a result, uh, we end up helping many of our, we, we end up working across the country actually with other DLI programs across the country where it may be just a couple of schools in a district. So the network of Chinese DLI schools in this country is, is pretty close. And we work on a daily basis with people all over the, all over the country. Um, to operate a program like we do a, with this size, uh, we have what are called fidelity assurances that are set forth through the state and this is an agreement by all the districts on how they will implement the program. Um, and this is uh, tied to the funding for the program. So this assures us the program is being implemented with fidelity. So it contains things like uh, the number of minutes that are devoted to each subject, um, the standards of 100% uh, target language in the classroom um, and uh, those sorts of things. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the middle school piece. Um, seventh and eighth grade, as you all likely know, uh, we significantly reduce the amount of time that our students have in DLI, not by choice. <laughs> that's just, that's the reality, as you all know. And so our time is cut in half. However, in that time period, this is when we really hope our students can make a lot of progress. So it's quite a challenge as we found the last five years in making this transition to junior high. The focus in the seventh and eighth grade is on deepening their language, our students' language skills um, and fine tuning those along with broadening their cultural understanding. And this is because the AP test is focused so much on culture. And the ninth grade is also, uh, that whole curriculum is aligned to uh, preparing for the AP test. So un unfortunately, and I'm gonna say unfortunately, uh, just because I feel that it is um, unfortunate that at, from the beginning, um, different messages were received about the AP uh, test. And, um, you know, people may have felt they were promised their children were going to pass the AP test in ninth grade. So I just wanted to provide a little perspective on the AP. In a minute, I'll share kind of how we've done the first three years um, and, and where that's going and at what we continue to do to build on that. Running this uh, program and building it as we have so quickly uh, has been like, uh, you know, you talk about painting a moving train or, you know, building the plane as you're flying it. Those are, are very um, apt descriptions of what the experience has been like for us, particularly in terms of teacher supply and training teachers and retraining teachers and retraining teachers. And all of that has its impact, of course, um, as we build up. But on the secondary pathway, um, we have different schools configured different ways when students come into seventh and eighth, if it's in a middle school situation, um, seventh and eighth can be divided into an intermediate school or, or middle school. But uh, you should know that there's one required class and that's the language piece. 
And the culture history and media piece is um, an option because we simply can't require it knowing all of the other um, courses that are required. But the thing I was going to just say earlier about AP was that um, I particularly, I, I would prefer the people just set their sights on 10th grade for AP and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but uh, Ninth, many ninth graders are ready and many 10th, and then if they're not ready, they can take it in 10th. And we really, really, really want students to understand they're not a failure if they do not pass the AP in ninth grade. Um, everybody's um, pathway has been different getting there. And so there's a two year window to pass of it, to pass it. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, visiting a international school in China uh, where they offer AP courses to their Chinese students. Uh, AP, you know, the same courses that we take here. Uh, I was really interested to see that they did the same thing where they had gave their students, they prepare the students um, with a two year window to pass the AP. And, and I think that's a great way to go about it. Okay, I see that Jill's here. Jill's oh, just joined us. Yeah, Jill, would you like to I'll stop sharing if you would like to um, introduce yourself and um, share your piece. Great, thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Good evening. Um, I will share my screen. Thanks, Stacy. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I was asked to give an overview of the bridge program, the continuation um, after the AP. Uh, exam year and I appreciate coming in just in time to hear Stacy talk about the AP exam. I, I feel very strongly that we need to, um, after working, watching students from grade one all the way through 12th grade, that we support students where they are in this amazing pathway. It is amazing where they are no matter the year that they are academically at the language that, that allows them to, to complete all of the tasks, all of the, the high level academic tasks for AP. So I hope you're celebrating all the great things your students have done. And now I'd like to tell you what happens in this transition post AP. So um, my name is Jill Landis Lee and I am state director for the bridge program. I work with all languages in the state um, I began working for the University of Utah Second Language Teaching and Research Center about eight years ago when our students were um, transitioning from elementary to middle school. And um, so I've been working with the middle school transition as students were, were being prepared for high school. It's really been an honor to work with um, scholars at the university level and, and learn about how to mesh our systems of higher education and K-12. Um, Utah has done an exceptional job in working together. And so I just want to give you a little big picture context on this, that our university systems, you can see in the top left corner of the slide, we have commitment by all six of the public universities in our state to accept, not only accept credit, but support these courses, support hiring faculty to come to the high schools one day a week, to work with your students, to give them um, like an early college experience really within uh, a lot of support, <laughs> a lot of support. So we're, we're not taking um, a on-campus course and expecting 15 year olds to to engage at the same level as a college junior we're taking a college course that is maintains the 3000 level college standards but we change instruction we change support we make sure that the topics are um, project based so there's lots of wonderful um, things that that higher ed has learned from k-12 and k-12 is vice versa learning from higher ed so in this partnership, um, whoops, I always forget on Zoom how to advance my slides. Um, 
has led to um, something that's very incredibly unique in, in the United States. And that is not only that there are post AP courses, there are post AP courses that, that exist in different states around the US. However, none of them take into account that our students post AP really are on the level of college juniors in terms of their language proficiency. So when you look at this pathway and you see the orange DLI moves into middle school, grades seven through nine, um, that where the courses are, are articulating to AP, then after, after the AP score of three or higher, then the students progress on to, to an early college experience. The, the unique thing is that after high school, our bridge program graduates are, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more what happens when they arrive on campus. And that's what is, is incredibly unique, that we're not placing them down into 1000 and 2000 level, the entry level freshman, sophomore courses. They bypass all of the 1000 and 2000 level courses after successful completion of one or more of their bridge courses. So um, this articulated pathway is, is really what is exciting to me, um, having worked for years in K-12, because then when students leave college, really the goal is that they can do whatever they want to do with their multilingualism and their study of culture. When students are past the AP level, these courses are culture courses in the language. <laughs> so their language proficiency is developing while they study culture. So they're, they're not studying um, how to write a certain kind of sentence. They're not studying how to um, do an AP task anymore. They're studying about people, about ideas. It's really, um, it's challenging and students need to be ready for that challenge and decide that they're going to commit to it. But it's also um, a very powerful way to allow students at an early age, 15 to 18 years old, to experience um, with support what college is like to get them ready, not only for academics, but for the behaviors, the academic behaviors that students need to succeed. So the course articulation is here, and I think you probably know about that, but you know you can see in the gray here, you can see the courses are the titles, the DLI-3, DLI-4, DLI-5, plus the option for culture, history, and media. The course numbers, when you um, begin the university coursework in the high school setting, are the numbers Chinese 3116, 3117, 3118. And then I will show you where you can go on the website, on the Bridge Program website and begin. I hope you spread the word. This is something that we work really hard to, to get out to parents. It's been difficult to spread this resource of where do you go um, on our site or in the state to see what happens when you arrive at college. So that's the next step I wanna show you. And there is a resource for you. Oh, okay, a real quick, this is a very quick overview. If I were gonna sum up what the bridge program is in about five quick bullets, they are university learning outcomes. They're university content. Second key point is that these, these courses and the credit for three credits for each course per year are accepted in a degree pathway, at, as I said, in all six of our public institutions. All of the private institutions will also look at the syllabus and um, determine alignment to their existing pathway, but public and private work differently. So um, for example, with BYU, certainly with their fabulous language programs, they have all agreed that they will look at the syllabus and they will determine the fit. And that's a normal thing for either private universities or out of state universities. Next bullet point is something I just mentioned, but I really want to hit home because this is not a 1000 level, 2000 level course. The fact that these courses are numbered 3000 level are part of what make them incredibly valuable in terms of credits, in terms of degree pathway, and having an accelerated college experience, potentially allowing students to, um, well, yeah, I'll tell you more about this, but uh, yeah, some benefits at college, I'll, I'll get there. Um, and this upper division credit, as I said, aligning to the minor and major pathways, the college readiness behaviors are important to practice while you're in high school. 
and um, also to support and sustain home languages and home cultures being very plural. We all come with different cultures, whether it's a linguistic culture or a, um, an, an environmental culture, and we support and um, build on wherever our students come from. Then the key points for the college study. After st um, students graduate, Bridge Program graduate graduates enter as freshmen to enroll in junior level language courses, junior level Chinese courses. This means accelerated degree completion, meaning that you're already up to, oh, I should know this number, 16 lower division credits plus up to nine upper division credits. So you're a long way into the minor pathway. Of course, students need to, in university study, I'll show you, you also need to be taking your general education coursework. So you're still a freshman, but your language coursework is highly accelerated. That opens up the opportunity for potential double majors um, in four years, which means that you can continue to studying Chinese while you pursue your passion of whatever it is you want to do chemistry, communications, um, peace and conflict studies. There's wonderful things that you can do with your uh, language and culture study. And then the financial savings. So I calculated on the upward end of our tuition for in-state tuition for public universities. So it would be up to $14,000 in savings if you attended the most expensive of our public universities. And of course, there's a range there. Um, Students do need to receive a grade of C or higher for courses to count towards a degree. So, and that's true of every course in, in higher ed. You can't have a, a earn a D or an, a certainly an F um, and have that count towards your bachelor's degree. So basically, you know, the, the goal here of, of being engaged civically, using your language experience, your cultural knowledge, our students' incredible wealth of, of learning, their experience over 12 years of study, then goes on to higher ed with a value on multi multilingualism and, and multiculturalism. Really, no matter the culture that they, they have been nurtured and grow in, they have grown in, in new ways because of the language and the people they have engaged with because of knowing more than one language. Um, and the heritage language pathway is definitely part of that. These mesh into a whole um, a system of, of K, K 16 pathway that we need both um, native English speaking students, we need native Chinese speaking students um, to enrich what we learn from each other and, and students from all over. So in a nutshell, this is kind of our system. So you start in orange in elementary school, you have gray middle school time where students can access when they're ready to access the AP exam, which then opens up the door to the early college and then articulates seamlessly into actual on-campus college and university study. So this is the resource I want to um, show you. And I'm with the Zoom screen. I am, I don't think I can copy this. Go off, sure, go. put the link in the chat. So the, the yes. link you've got there is in the chat. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to have to stop sharing. I'm going to have to get out I, of my presentation. I already put. You got it? Oh, thank Jill, you. I already, oh, you yes, already, I already put it. in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Chi. Yeah. All right. So this link here is what I'd encourage you to have your children play around on. And of course you may want to do that, but I want to emphasize how important it is to get your kids on these sites in 10th, certainly by 11th grade, have them begin to click around on all the links that exist on this document that I'm about to show you. Um, because when, when we ask students to continue on to this next level, which is a, a rigorous level of study, we need students to decide why they're here. <laughs> and I got to tell you, having taught adolescence myself for years, we need to we need to give teenagers in, in junior high and high school the prompts to decide why they're going to engage. Why? Why? What would you, what will you do with this? What might you do? And we need to let give them some tools to start exploring what new avenues, new 
you know, things are they going to explore and study in college that, that involve Chinese instead of saying, you know what, you got to take it. <laughs> and you can still say that you can still want them to take it. But we need to really, really allow adolescents that space to, to decide how this fits in with what they aspire to be. What might you become? What is this going to bring you? What could you do? And if they start looking at the links on these um, on these documents, they're going to start linking to the different universities and they're going to see programs and they'll link to something else and they'll see a list of majors and they'll go, oh, I never knew I could use Chinese for that. And it doesn't matter if they choose that thing that they saw when they were in 10th grade. It matters that they begin looking. It matters that they begin seeing how language and culture study can be used in all different interesting ways that they may not know, you know, exist for them in their future yet. So when you go to this minor and major, um, this red bar that's across our home page, then the next thing that you'll it will bring you to is this PDF and you'll need to download the PDF. And that is a, a running document and the page one looks like this. And it's a snap. This is just a snapshot. It's not the whole thing. Um, otherwise, it would have been so tiny. But then you can see at the different universities, the public universities in our state, which degrees are offered. Um, if you go down, this is a, again just bubbling, making it really large, but it's a it's just a Word document that's made into a PDF and you'll see all six of our universities and you can find what's really key here is that your child will have and you will have an actual name and an email of the person to go to who should advise you as a bridge program graduate. Don't go to general advising for bridge program advising. You need to go to someone in the Department of Languages. And um, those people are ready for you. They have the pathway set. They know the courses. They've been involved with our curriculum development. And we work with them all the time. What can happen inadvertently is you go to the normal freshman pathway, which is general advising. Like you don't have any college credit or very little, and you just show up as a freshman. Normal freshman entry is gonna place you right into a 1000 level course, but your students are not at 1000 level courses. And general advising may be confused still because the universities are so big. There are some people who have missed that bridge courses are, are, are very different and they are um, accepted. So this is, this is an important link. The other thing I just snapped, did a quick snapshot of, of an example from UVU, their Chinese um, minor and um, pathways, which of course link to a major. Um, the goal is to link it to a major. So it, it will tell your student that if you took, let's say the maximum number of bridge courses, you can take up to three courses, nine credits, then your next course will be Chinese, the number Chinese 3050. That's the one to take. You don't have to wonder what to take. You don't have to say, I, maybe I want to take 3040. Don't take 3040. You have to take 3050. And so um, this is this is our our attempt to really spell this out so that kids can maximize the benefit. So you know what's next and you can pursue the minor. And, and UVU also happens to offer something called a Chinese studies minor. Um, which is a little bit different from Chinese language. So those, again, those are things that your students will need to start exploring. You can actually, at the um, the advisor the email, you can make appointments while you're still in high school and meet with a college advisor and ask questions and say, I think I wanna go to Weber State. What do you have going on? Tell me about how this works. I mean, they're, they're happy to meet with you early. We're also organizing, um, hopefully we'll have an online event with some of the college advisors this spring, I'm hoping. And um, you can get on or see recordings if you can't join live. So here's a quick example. Some, some two of our universities so far have actually created a, an actual website page that's specifically for bridge program graduates. So the U of U link is there, Weber State's link is there, and you can kind of see how this looks, but it's, it's new, it's different. It's not for on-campus um, students who have begun Chinese at the 1000 level on campus. It's specifically for our bridge program graduates. This is an example of a, um, a pathway worksheet. I don't know if for those of you who um, completed a degree, you probably worked on something similar to this, but you have to get this sheet of paper and you submit it and you declare your intent 
to continue with this minor and you have to do that. So this is an example from the U of U. It's the first one I've seen on a website. Um, everyone has one, but it was nice that this was published and it's, it's available to look at on the website. And I'm playing around with my, oh, my Zoom settings so I can see everything on my screen here. There we go. And then this is um, how it would continue to complete a major. So as you go along, remember completing a beginning a minor in a major pathway is different from earning a bachelor's degree. They connect <laughs> you to earn a bachelor's degree. You, you would declare a minor and definitely you have to declare a major, but students also have general education coursework to complete, which is the normal 1000 and 2000 level coursework. So I think I have one more slide. We're just um, showing the phenomenal growth and the promise um, of, of the DLI and bridge program pathway. The first year we began bridge program courses in 2016, we just had four high school sites, about 100 kids. Our current year, we're at 2,400 students and 48 high school sites. Next year, we're projected to balloon up to 5,300 students enrolled. So um, whether, whether your child ends up um, accessing one course, two courses, or three courses, again, is not bad or good. <laughs> it's not, it's just, if you can get even into and accessing one of these courses, then you have accomplished that leap past lower division into upper division coursework, and you're well on your way to um, kind of an accelerated pathway for a degree and for a major. So that's it, that's what I have. I hope that was enough, but not too much. Um, I'm happy to take questions or Stacy, just take, I defer to you if you'd like to do something else. <laughs> well, I just would like everybody to understand how unique um, this is for us to have in Utah. There is there is no other state that has an articulation all the way through like this or a connection to the university. To be able to connect um, all of our institutions of higher education, um, to this program is just something that's phenomenal. Um, and Jill has just uh, done a fabulous job in all of the <laughs> communications and logistics that have gone to bringing that about. I mean, it really is um, an amazing model and there is no other state that has that to, to be able to offer to their students. So as she mentioned, I would just love to emphasize this again whether it's one bridge course, two bridge courses, or three, just getting to the bridge course um, puts you at that upper division level and, and, and allows you to have that accelerated pathway. So um, we also are really pleased that there's funding um, to be able to make that possible. And so, yeah. I think you continued. Remember, yes. we don't don't forget to get political on that one. We have well, to go back for requests for funding increase, or we cannot expand. So we need your support. Um, perhaps your Facebook platform might be a good place to to put that out there. But we will need to. Um, you, I, w that's part of why I show the enrollment increase on that last slide, the second to last slide, is that we are only funded for as much as we have to cover. Um, through a three-year block of, of funding. So every three years, we have to go back every two years to plan for the, the fourth year um, to request, to re whoops, am I there? Yes. Yep. <laughs> to request an increase for funding. Right. And uh, I did mention about the funding for the, the K-9 piece as well. Oh, good. There is a question about in the chat, will BYU be offering bridge program in the future? Um, BYU is not a, obviously is not a public institution. Our bridge pro, our DLI and bridge program are funded through legislative money that can only go to public higher education and public K-12 as a public, because our public universities are funded differently from private universities, right? So, so the, the, the USBE entity, the Utah State Board of Education, is the body that um, lobbies to fund DLI, and that's the K-12 course sequencing. After the AP year, it shifts into higher ed, but it's still public funding. 
it's not private funding it's it's public money and so we again that's that's the the link to our state legislature without their support for continued increases in ongoing um, funding we cannot um, support the the ballooning that we know is going to happen in our enrollment so we want to keep opening sites and keep opening sections um, and so byu is not part of public school funding is the bottom line does that make sense did i answer your question jackson um, that also, I guess you should also mention then, I mean, for the students that might want to go to BYU that take bridge courses. Um, totally different. They're, yeah. They're, they're, they're getting credit through, for example, if they're, if they're in Alpine district or if they're in Provo district, you know, they're being serviced through UVU. And so that's where, do you want to clarify where yeah. their credit would be? Mm -hmm. So when I was mentioning the pathways and the document that helps students to know what to do when they graduate from high school, that document about the university pathways, remember I, I was mentioning BYU is engaged, but the way they accept credit is different in a private institution. So that's different from Jackson's question. So BYU will not send, they, they will not teach at high schools. They will not teach in the bridge program because they're private, not public. That's number one. But number two, Stacy is reminding everybody that that doesn't mean that your the courses don't count. They just count by um, the department looking at the syllabus and finding a fit. Um, if there is one, they have the discretion to say there isn't, but that would be like shooting themselves in the foot. Let's hope they don't do that because <laughs> we want our kids to be able to access BYU's programs as well. So they, but it's, it's their discretion to decide what fits and how it fits with their degree pathway. Public universities, it's done. They've already fit it. It's already, it's already meshed. <laughs> so there's no ambiguity. There's no wondering. It's already done. Um, BYU is engaged. We're, they just are still chewing on this a bit. <laughs> Great. Okay, thanks, Jill. If there's no other questions, we'll just circle back and I'll finish up real quickly before we transition to Galal shirt. Um, so let's get back over here to I think where we were talking about AP. So how do we all get to, how do we help our students get to the bridge? And we were just talking about AP, as we mentioned, uh, whatever year um, AP is passed, uh, that allows students to go into the bridge program. Um, if your student uh, does not, if a student does not pass in 10th grade, um, they still have a way to pass AP and she can maybe mention this later in her part, it would not be through taking the AP course, they could not get credit for the course um, again, but they, as I, if I understand correctly, they can still take the test again. And maybe she, yeah, you can talk about that when we get to you um, in a minute. Chi um, or Galao sorry. <laughs> Galashir actually is an AP, uh, Chinese AP grader. So she's been that, uh, done that for many years. She's a pro and she'll have a lot of insight on that. Um, so just quickly here to just finish up about this pathway, we were talking about the culture, history and media. Just real quickly, I really want to just make this point that the whole focus of our program is on proficiency. And Intermediate proficiency is where we want all of our teachers, regardless of their grade level, to be pointing their students. First graders can, even in their beginning stages, they can do tasks and say things that are at an intermediate level, as long as the teacher gives them that opportunity. And so this is where we try to help our teachers focus their instruction. And what are our standards? How do, when we talk about intermediate, what does that mean? So the standard that we use is one that's determined by the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. We affectionately call it ACTFL. Nobody wants to say any long names. On this graphic, you can see um, we start at the bottom, the lowest level of proficiency. And each one has three sublevels, low, mid, and high. Um, the high level of one is basically about the same as the low of the next. It just depends on which one they spend the greater percentage of time in. But you can see that this cone spreads out. And what that tells us is that as we go up, um, there's, uh, things become more broad. There's a foundation that we started with has to broaden out. 
and the spaces between them also broaden. So it takes longer to progress from the levels, from one level to the sub-level to the next as we go up. So uh, just because we were able to get from novice low to novice high in you know, a year or a year and a half or two, um, the intermediate level um, is, takes a, a lot of time. So when we talk about proficiency, um, this is a simple definition here. It's what you can do with the language, not what you just know about the language and in real life situations. And so this is when we really know it's just like uh, first time I went overseas, I had just learned, started learning Chinese and you find yourself um, in a situation that, that you have no idea how to, how to uh, navigate. I remember way back when uh, that, that happened to me and I had to go to the post office and I thought, I don't even know the word for stamp or you know whatever, this is back in the day. And so how you use what you know to navigate situations. So, this example here is just to say, we want our students to be driving the car, to be using their language. And that's what these um, assessments uh, measure. And so with our teachers, this is what we have to spend a lot of time trying to help um, train our teachers with understanding what proficiency means. Because if any of you took a foreign language in high school um, or junior high, I'm, my guess is that uh, we all had similar experiences where um, you took for three years and you can remember a couple of songs. It's not that you really learned how to use the language or to make crepes or pinatas or whatever. So um, proficiency is a much deeper thing. So in our program, we've just talked about, uh, been heard, heard about the bridge. Related to proficiency, uh, there's a wonderful opportunity for our students that come through DLI to be able to obtain a seal of biliteracy. And as you can see on this slide, I don't wanna read it all for you, but essentially this seal is something that is included um, on their transcript. Um, many, this is administered through each district. So you'd need to look on your district website to see what their requirements are, how they have it set up and when you apply. Students apply as a senior However, they can be earning um, or earning the evidence or the uh, to be able to show their proficiency from the ninth grade on up. So um, the AP test is one way that that can be done. The Apple test is another way that that can be done. But this is something that is not unique to Utah. This is across the entire country. Um, nearly all of our states have adopted the seal of biliteracy as actual national um, uh, movement, and then Utah adopted its version. So this is something that can sh that your students can use um, as evidence of their skills uh, for future employers. It is on their transcript, um, as I said, as well as honoring them. I mean, especially however many years you've been through, if they stay with the program, which we hope they do all the way through 12th grade, um, it's a wonderful thing for them to be able to have. Uh, and then um, the AP language and culture exam is the other a measure, is a measure of a proficiency that can be used to earn the seal. Um, I just, in interest of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on here, just uh, for awareness, uh, recognize that the AP test is heavily focused on culture in all of these themes. And so our students need to be conversive with cultural themes that connect to all of these areas. Um, and there's a little simple task list there of the AP tasks. So again, um, proficiency is what we really wanna focus on. And so I wanted to just share with you just for uh, perspective, we recognize that for students to pass AP, um, and she, uh, you're welcome to correct anything I say here, but from what our experience has been, I think it's understood in the field that students generally need to be at the intermediate mid-level to be able to pass AP. So what is on this slide are the targets for proficiency that we uh, have for Spanish, German, Portuguese, and French. Um, 
we look at those as Western languages. I suppose if you look where the intermediate mid-level targets are, you can see that beginning in fifth and sixth grade with listening is where they start. And listening is always the lead skill. Um, the skills develop across you know, in, these, in this order most typically. Um, and then when they are uh, in eighth grade or seventh and eighth grade is when we're hoping that they are intermediate mid and uh, with their writing. So when they get to ninth grade, um, it's, you can see that many of them are already at their intermediate high would be the target for those languages. In contrast, um, Chinese and Russian, our targets are not the same as Spanish. We know that Chinese is a different category of language um, as designated through the, um, what we usually refer to the Department of Defense's um, Category, categorization of languages and their difficulty. So Chinese is a category four, the same as Russian. So our intermediate mid um, students are just getting into there in eighth and ninth if they're on target. So it's about a year um, or so behind what the other languages are. And how do we get there? Well, I mentioned before we need time. Uh, we also need articulated curriculum we need proficiency centered classrooms and culturally authentic experiences. So we on all of these levels are trying to continually add to and enhance. I wanted to make you aware at the bottom here, I have utahonline.org. And the question in the chat um, uh, from Heather about uh, requiring the culture history and media course. Um, I would love to find out which school and I, it's not a required course. I suppose that districts uh, might have, I don't know, do they have the liberty to require that? I guess they can if they, but from the state level, it's not required. But I wanted to make you aware of utahonline.org uh, because this year we piloted um, teaching that course um, through the online um, public charter school, Utah Online, um, and we anticipate that next year um, we will be able to make that as well as actually all of our secondary courses um, available online, knowing that uh, many times students run into scheduling issues and are not able to get the culture, history and media class. And because it's so, such an important piece of preparing for AP, we wanna make sure that there's every opportunity for students to take that course. Um, I was going to just introduce that um, real quickly here. It is a two year sequence and um, many schools have to, have to um, organize it differently in terms of not being able to offer everything each term, but we really hope our students can in some way, shape or form be able to participate in that. A minute ago, Jill was talking about having our students find um, what they wanna be or what they wanna do. I think it's, it's been my feeling that our students from the beginning, it's my goal that they find a passion, that they find something in Chinese culture that gets them excited, uh, whether it's um, pandas or whether it's um, the Sichuan food or whether it's you know, face changing or whatever it is that early on we give them enough opportunities and exposure uh, before they get to middle school. And this is one reason I'm excited about our fifth and sixth grade camp. This is the critical time, as you all know, if you have kids that are at that grade level where they, they are trying to decide, do I really wanna keep doing this? Like I did this for my mom and dad, but now there's a lot of other exciting things. So we wanna help them find things that they're, that they're really excited about. Um, just gonna hop down here to AP. So that's it on the culture, history and media. Uh, Utahonline.org is gonna be offering that again next year online, as well as the language courses uh, for students that might be still doing online learning. Um, real quickly, quick tour through AP, uh, just to get some perspective. Um, we've done three years of AP Chinese here in Utah, and it's been a learning experience every year. Uh, we have a different mix of teachers every year, uh, which is a challenge. Um, when we started out in 2018, I took a look at just the passing rates of other AP tests, and I was surprised to find out 
the range um, of the passing rates in these in these um, courses like my kids took AP and I, I never as a parent actually thought to look that up. <laughs> and what I found um, in 2018, and this is not the case this year, it appears that they've changed it and they're not reporting it the same way, but for the first, um, in 2018, and prior to that, they report the scores um, by two groups of students. One of them um, is called the standard group. And that is the group that our students belong to in 2018, which is basically students who are not heritage, uh, not have Chinese heritage. And the rest of them are um, heritage. So they have Chinese background. Why would they do that? <laughs> Uh, this is just the, this was 2017, for example, that where I have an arrow here, this shows that the, um, the passing rate for the non-heritage students was 70% um, and 92% for the heritage ones. Um, and this was the 28 non-heritage pass rate was 68. Um, so you can see the majority of students taking the AP Chinese test are of Chinese heritage. And, and so that um, was a way that they have uh, reported things up till now. Um, where we are right now, um, you can see right here, uh, hopefully we'll keep going up. I have every confidence in the world that we will with all of the um, things that we have been implementing. Uh, we've got new curriculum. We've also, um, we also have uh, developed some new uh, Canvas courses from our teachers who were, had really successful AP classes to share their secrets with um, all the other teachers. So we've got very articulated supports for the curriculum. We have um, a new curriculum that we're piloting with seventh and eighth that's directly aligned a little more explicitly. And we've also understood as we've grown that um, AP is not just a ninth grade teacher's responsibility, it's every grade level's teacher all the way up. And so this year we began training, um, we offered training to all of our teachers from first grade on up for AP and uh, Galal sure helped us uh, immensely with that so that everybody understands how we all fit together in the whole pathway. I'm just finishing what I hope um, for our students as we started out with, uh, I shared a number of the camps that we're doing. Um, there are a lot of things that we will be introducing um, in coming months to continue to support our students outside the classroom. Um, you mentioned about um, the transition to middle school and helping our students have opportunities before uh, they get there, having AP Chinese prep camps, um, experiences, authentic experiences abroad. We hope those are coming soon. Um, next fall, we'll be having an education fair. I'm working with the embassy on that right now uh, for opportunities for internships and study abroad, as well as our local community. So we, there are so many ways we want our students to be able to um, take their language um, out there and meet the world. So. Uh, Thank you for all of your support in helping us uh, meet our goal of becoming a world-class program. Chi, I'll turn it over to you. Stacey, maybe just one question just came into the chat. Uh, finding out about the camps, like there's gonna be more coming through the line, like maybe a Chengdu camp? Right, okay, so the, the, um, the protocol for the camps is that, well, we will always um, send it to administrators first then teachers. And so we always will go through the school channel, but as soon as we have a camp, we will definitely be working through this organization through Craig to um, advertise that. Um, and with each camp, it's uh, the collaboration has been a little different picture. And so the word has gotten out differently. Our fifth and sixth grade camp um, filled up in one day. Uh, we had a hundred slots and um, uh, we, we eventually just had to close it before, uh, my, before the deadline. Uh, so we anticipate there will be a number uh, of them coming up and we'll definitely get the word out to Craig as well. At the same time, I send it to the schools. So from both ways, thank you for the question. I'm so excited to have this group. <laughs>
there are certain things I can share and others I can't. So this is great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Stacy and Gaulacher. You, you will listen to Gaulacher talking about the bridge program. More details there. Thanks. And questions, feel free to type them into the chat and uh, we'll try to ask them when we get a break. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, give you a brief introduction to the Chinese Bridge Program. I hope uh, <laughs> I hope you are not that tired. <laughs> so if you want to move around, it's fine. Please feel free. We, we've been through like a Zoom for a whole year, so we know how difficult it could be staying you know, in front of the computer and then watching, like looking at the screen. Okay, so uh, like what uh, Stacy and uh, Jill just mentioned, the Chinese bridge program is bridging the gap between uh, the completion of the AP exam and the learning Chinese in college. So if students pass the AP exam in the ninth grade, so they can take the uh, Chinese bridge course in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. If they take the test in the uh, 10th grade and then pass it, they still can take the, the bridge course for two years. And we, st we also have students who pass their AP in the 11th grade, so they still can have an opportunity to take the bridge course in the senior year. So this program actually serves the, not only the students in the DLI uh, program, but also the heritage learners and uh, maybe also some students who started to learn Chinese in the middle school earlier. So um, the opportunity is kind of open to, to all kind of uh, students from different routes. So that's uh, what I want to uh, share with you. And so each, uh, each year when the students uh, um, finish the, the the course, since it's a, a concurrent enrollment course, so which equals to the 3000 level uh, college course, uh, just like what uh, Jill mentioned. So then students, if they pass the course, they can earn three university credits per course, plus one full high school credit uh, for each year. And then this course is not like a college course because normally the college course is like uh, for semester. But this year, uh, this course is kind of full year of study, which can support the high school setting. So that's something a little bit different from the from the uh, usual high school course. So with being uh, with being said, if students uh, take like a three Chinese bridge course in high school. So by the senior year, they can earn up to nine credits. So um, all of these credits will be recognized and accepted by all six public universities in Utah, like uh, what Jill uh, just mentioned. So um, then when they go to the college, they would just need maybe two more upper division Chinese courses in order to uh, declare their minor in uh, Chinese, because normally if they want to declare a minor in Chinese, they need 15 upper division language course and uh, language credits. So by the end of senior year, if they earn already up to nine credits, so that means they only need six more credits for the uh, for being uh, declared as minor. So that's something uh, a lot of uh, uh, parents should know. So um, Chinese bridge course actually joined the uh, bridge course, bridge uh, program in 2018. Maybe uh, you can see from this timeline. So Spanish started early, so we joined like two years later. And then we offer three courses on a three year uh, rotation. So each year the same course with the same course number and content 
offered by all institutions across the state. So everybody follow the same. So we have a 3118 in 2018 and then 3116 in 2019 and 3117 currently in this year. And next year we will go back to 3118. So it's kind of a rotation. And right now in uh, the across Utah, we have uh, 15 high schools offer uh, the bridge course, uh, Chinese bridge course, uh, located in eight different school districts. So they are total like 28 classes and about 650 students. And next year, we will have two more school districts uh, joining our program. And then there will be uh, around 24 high schools offering the Chinese bridge program, about 44 classes. But I'm not so sure how many students could, will be because depending on if they can pass the AP or not. So this is uh, the uh, brief number for that. So since this course is kind of co uh, like a concurrent enrollment offered by the universities, so that's why we follow the co-teaching model in each classroom. So the co-teaching model, that means um, uh, the uh, course, each year the course is uh, co-planned and co-taught by two different teachers, one from university and one from the high school. So then they co-planned and design the lessons together and they uh, jointly discuss student performance and instructional needs and also provide feedback on student performance in a, a regular basis. So normally it's weekly basis, but in the class and then it's like whenever the both teachers are in the class, they can share the responsibilities and then offer uh, like provide feedback to students. So this is uh, the co-teaching model. And then actually we have five main goals for the Chinese Bridge program. The first one, of course, to enhance students' Chinese language proficiency and then cultural competences. So this is our number one goal, like uh, what uh, uh, Stacy just mentioned to you, show you the target, the proficiency target uh, uh, across the Utah. So our level, our main goal is to uh, enhance students' uh, level to be in the advanced level, which is a little bit higher than, you know, the AP requirements. And then the second one is, uh, is that we hope to provide students uh, with higher order thinking skills, which can help them deal with the, the real life situations and the, to solve the problems. So that's our main goal too. And through discussing some complex cultural and contemporary issues, we hope to expand student uh, horizons and prepare them for college readiness and global readiness. So finally, of course, we want to help, uh, we want to cultivate our students to become a like future leaders in all different area, different fields with two language proficiencies and uh, cultural competences, as well as a global view. So that's our goal for the uh, Chinese Bridge program and how we are going to achieve that one. So now I'm going to introduce you some, uh, give you some pre uh, brief introduction about our course for each year. So this is the Chinese 3116. So the title for this course is Exploring China, Past, Present, and You. So basically we cover four units, Chinese history, Chinese etymology about the Chinese words, how they developed, and then Chinese philosophies and internal, uh, inter, inter, internationalization of Chinese Western interactions in the history. So then uh, I would just show you one example of the assessment. We call it unit performance assessment. So that this one is uh, the assessment for the Chinese philosophies unit. So we organize a town hall meeting for students to discuss with, uh, with each other about the ancient, uh, how to apply Chinese philosophies to manage the pandemic situation effectively in the community. So that's our topic. We did that in May last year. So now I'm going to show you some part of the uh, discussion during the uh, the town hall meeting. So 
uh, while you are watching it because I, I didn't have time to put the subtitles so I will explain it a little bit so I'm going to show you uh, this part which is uh, a discussion about Taoism so how Taoism can be applied to deal with the uh, pandemic situation in the community so this part of the discussion is among like a four different classes in three different high schools. So we combine them together so students can kind of meet with uh, the students who are in the same program, but in different uh, classroom, different uh, schools. So each of them will give a pre presentation in the beginning showing their stand about this uh, topic. And then later on, we open the floor for discussion. So I'm going to show you the discussion part, how students uh, uh, share their uh, views about this topic. So this is from one, one uh, student in one high school. So she mentioned, he mentioned that, uh, uh, please explain why do you want to use Taoism and then what's the advantage and disadvantage of do, doing that in the community to deal with the pandemic? Um, so she, she mentioned that Taoism is giving people more freedom. So the government can encourage people to put on masks and keep this distance. So they don't give the uh, very strict rules. So this this person say the dis disadvantage is that if you give too much freedom to 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 people and then they might you know uh, destroy uh, the community because they don't want to follow the rules. Okay, so this is something like a, among all different kinds of uh, opinions about uh, this topic. So, so you can tell how students uh, participate in discussion and in, in a, a unit performance assessment. So this is uh, this year's course, so we also have four uh, units. So the first one is the artistic expression and stories and then human geographies and migration. And then we also talk about science and technologies in China and then education and civil service in China right now. So then students, uh, we just finished one, uh, one uh, unit performance assessment, which is about uh, 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 migration. So we let the students to interview the first generation Chinese immigrants in the community. So then they have to make a short documentary and then also the right to write a story to uh, for this uh, interviewee. And then they will show their documentary to the younger DLI kids in the elementary school or in the middle schools. So and now I'm going to show you the students' feedback. I just recorded this morning. So they are talking about this, uh, how they think uh, about this project-based learning uh, opportunities. So I will show you what they say. It, they, they said in English. Um, hi, so for our most recent project, we went and interviewed um, a teacher at Lone Peak, right? Um, and we were able to ask him questions about um, his immigration to the U.S. and ask about his experience with that and um, compare, compare and contrast um, the U.S. to his country of origin. Um, yeah, so during his project, like she said, we just kind of compare and contrast um, everything that he did where he lived and then in America as well. I feel like this was really good for us, though, because it kind of gave us real-life learning. We were able to talk to an actual immigrant from China 
and um, we were able to hear their experiences coming over to America. And so I feel like it kind of helps us to, um, everything that we're learning, we were able to see that with somebody that we were interviewing. And I think the same can be said for all the projects we've done throughout the years in this bridge course. A lot of our learnings based off of these projects, whether they be different essays or making videos like this or presentations. And it kind of brings it back to the real world and being able to kind of understand what we're learning, especially when you're learning something in a different language. At first, you, you're only learning in the one language, but once you can transfer it into the real world, then it becomes a, a lot more important to you almost. So I think that doing these projects has really helped me to understand different cultures and people and to overall just kind of be a better person in understanding the world and how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this morning, this morning we just finished uh, interacting with the younger kids. So this is I took a we, we had a Zoom meeting with the fifth graders in Draper Elementary School. So they kind of after they watch our uh, short documentary, and then we kind of ask uh, each class to ask questions to the other one. So then I will I just show you some parts about the questions they kind of ask each other. So the older kids ask the younger one, what sports is your, which one is your favorite sport? So they ask us which grade level, which grade level is your favorite? <laughs> so he said, I like the first grade because I don't remember anything I learned. <laughs> Did she say my favorite is my, my current grade level? So he said my favorite is the 10th grade because I can drive now. So they kind of share with each other what they think about their life. So we had an interaction about like 15 to 20 minutes this morning. So, and we also did that with the Draper Park and, uh, Middle School, like uh, uh, with the eighth graders and also the sixth graders. And on Monday, we also discuss, uh, have a dis uh, interactions with the fourth graders in uh, Draper Elementary School. And then the other part of the, uh, the other region of the bridge program, they did with their, uh, the schools nearby. So they, they all did some interactions with the, the younger kids. So that's a purpose because we want to bring the whole program together and in, we want to show the, uh, the, uh, the younger kids how they are going to, you know, uh, what, how, how they can pursue to the upper grades. So that's why we arrange these kind of interactions among each other. And then this is the, uh, the 3, 000, uh, 3118 class, which we will cover or will teach next year. So it's about the uh, pop culture, Chinese pop culture. So it's consumer, uh, like a consumer culture, folk cultures, and performing arts and visual arts in the modern Chinese society. So, and we, one of the examples is we, we did Socrates seminar. So they discuss about the folk cultures in China and they had really great time like uh, two years ago they did they did the same curriculum so and maybe as you may have, have found the progression of these three courses is from like ancient history to chinese legacies which connect ancient history to modern uh, cultures and technologies so that's 
the concept behind those three uh, three courses. So um, thank you very much. So now I will open the floor for the uh, question and answer. So as uh, Jill mentioned, this is our bridge website. So you can go to the website and then find out more information about the bridge. And if you have any questions uh, regarding the Chinese bridge program, please feel free to email me. So this is my email address. And thank you so much. Xie xie. Thank you, Galao Sure. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and the parents, appreciate everybody sticking in. Um, covered a lot of material, you know, 12 different grades and lots of different programs from elementary through the junior high, middle school, through the high school, which is the college courses. So this is a chance for parents to reach out. And I, I think we're a small enough group that you could maybe unmute your mic and ask your question, or if you prefer to put a question in the chat. But this is a chance for parents to mention things that are on our minds or and there have been kind of flows of conversation in the chat, which I think are useful. People are talking about um, you know, like the, the culture class in middle school and whether that could be required or is there a way to get um, say English language arts credit for the Chinese course that might enable the students to get more Chinese exposure in junior high. I sense that that's a topic that's on parents' minds, but I want you to take a chance and let us know what um, questions you have on the program. So anyone who's ready to jump in, Stacy, did you have something to say? I was just going to say I was reading. Yeah, there's a couple of uh, questions there. Um, again, on the culture piece, right? We really do hope the principals um, do encourage their students and make it possible for them to be able to take that. Um, it's a little bit difficult, and pl some places have trimesters, others have um, uh, semesters. Uh, but because, as I said, that is so key preparation, such key preparation for AP. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the utahonline.org this year, it's actually been phenomenal um, as far as the online courses go run through that school. Um, that The classes for Chinese DOI um, have basically no dropouts where it compared to all of the other courses, it's really worked out well for the kids. So I always wanted to have an option i'm excited that that's there so know that that's there for the key for the specific purpose of schedule issues knowing how limited uh, junior high schedules are um, but by the same token we do hope that principals um, are are um, looking at how to be able to make it possible for kids to take that and so if you have specific situations um, where you feel like you need some more support for that reach out to myself and leaping I didn't introduce her earlier. Um, Li Ping, do you want to wave? Oh, hi everyone. <laughs> should have, we should have had her in on this conversation. She's um, my secondary coordinator for seventh through ninth grade and doing a phenomenal job um, at that. She works very closely with all of the teachers. And so we um, are happy to work with you and your, in your community if you feel like you need more support for that or looking at how to, to provide different options, we know it gets, every, every school has a different uh, scheduling situation. So there's no a one size fits all, um, which is why we try to have options, but um, yeah. Um, well, look, can I just jump in quick? There's a question for Galao, sure, here from Amy. She's written, how do you go about enhancing the high school students' language proficiency when they only have the class two days a week, for example, on an A and B schedule, curious about strategies. What can we do as parents to try to support? I get the sense that, you know, first through sixth, we're half day, it's a lot of exposure. We feel like we're making progress. And then you start to get into seventh, eighth grade and the amount of time in class drops off. What strategies or advice do you have for us as parents to try to keep the momentum? Sure, thank you so much. And I think the, the top, uh, strategies is application, application, and application. <laughs> so we try to help students to apply what they have learned right away in the class. So we encourage students to do the, uh, we, we kind of uh, uh, do the flip classroom concept. So students will preview what they need to read at home through a, a special program we call the Pondi Reader. So they kind of uh, preview first. So 
when they come back to the classroom, so we can focus on more about discussions. So through discussions, so they are ap applying what they have learned from the readings, and then they can make summary, and then they can discuss with like a through pair share, think pair share, and write. So we encourage about writing as well. So every time when they finish reading one paragraph, we encourage them to do some summary, and then we provide a lot of like uh, questions with higher order thinking skills like uh, analyze things synthesize things and then also do the uh, uh, application evaluation as well so that's why uh, our students are able to use those things what they learned through discussions so that's our strategies so it's hard it's very hard but yeah, so i think Gala, sure, I think also part of the question is that with limited amount of time in class, because it's cut down more, what things can they do outside of class? You know, like, for example, um, like Stacy's been organizing these courses in the evenings with China that are through the online or summer camps. I know some, for example, um, Chinese or Taiwanese, they send their kids to China for the summer. And sometimes that takes care of it, just having two or three months of really intense language. Any other advice yeah. along those lines? What can students do outside of class or how can they be organized to be effective in continuing their language? Yeah, so that's why we also encourage students to join the camp uh, Stacy organized for them. So then also we plan to take them to, to China during summertime, but because of the, <laughs> due to the pandemic situation. So then we cannot do that, unfortunately, last year. And this year, maybe we cannot do that again. So we will encourage them to join some summer camp as well. But meanwhile, on the daily basis, we encourage them to read more things through the Poundy Reader that I mentioned. So a lot of the high schools already purchase the accounts for students. So they, they can have a lot of reading resources through that website. So not only the text, but also through that, uh, that web website. And then, by the way, and then we also organize a lot of opportunities for schools to talk to each other. You know, we have like competitions among each other. So we try to ha organize some uh, opportunity for students to interact with uh, the other students. Maybe we are thinking to do that with the Chinese students in the future. So maybe through Zoom, everything's possible now. So, Kalashir, the readers that you mentioned, could you write that maybe into the chat just so people know? Is that something that people have access to that are in high school? Uh, because it seems okay. like reading is so critical to support the verbal skills and that if the students are reading in their free time and in the summers, their language will really improve and maybe parents can encourage that. I know I talked to Professor Bourgerie at BYU and he said his daughter was learning French and she got really interested in French fashion. And then she was picking up French magazines and reading it in French because she was really interested in the subject. And so if students can find subjects they're interested in and do reading on their own that they care about, their levels are gonna really skyrocket. Maybe that might be a, a strategy. Yes. For sure, I think that comes back to the passion piece, you know, to if as parents, um, what can you do? I, I, I would just say, um, provide opportunities for them to explore different things within the culture or um, anything that comes with the community online to help them really find something to connect with. They might not know what they're going to be, um, but if they have an interest or there's something there that they really love about Chinese, and maybe it's calligraphy, maybe it's writing, maybe it's reading, maybe it's a topic, but something like you say that can spur them on, Craig, to more reading. Um, somebody mentioned in the chat about their daughter uh, watching dramas. Um, you know, that's fabulous. Chinese dramas, you know, TV show things. There's so much um, available online and YouTube um, that can just bring them right in. I remember we did a panel with junior high students a couple of years ago in our teacher training. And one of the girls was sharing um, how much her Chinese just grew because you've got a context. You've got an authentic context, not the classroom in, in a Chinese, you know, in a TV show or a drama where you pick up all the little things um, that happen in a conversation, all the little um, pieces that might not get included in your formal conversations like you might learn in the classroom. I just, there's another great 
suggestion in the chat about older students mentoring younger students, you know, maybe helping other students prepare for the AP test or going to the elementary schools and volunteering or finding ways to be involved in, um, you know, Chinese language environments besides just that one high school class. For sure. Um, and um, Shari, thanks for bringing that up. Um, that that does That is beginning to happen. It's something I'd love to do strategically within districts. You know, our greatest resource is that we have each other. Um, in, within our districts, you know, we have three, four, five elementary schools or two or three junior high schools. Um, those are opportunities for students to collaborate um, beyond their classroom uh, with the same, with from, you know, working always with the same students that they've been with for 10 years or 11 years. Or, you know, um, That was one of the exciting things about the Kung Fu camp the students shared was how fun it was for them to, number one, be reminded there were other people in the state learning Chinese besides them, and that they could make friends with kids from other schools. I mean, same time zone, um, and it just uh, is very motivating. So that's a, I, I really would love to see things at the elementary level once we kind of get back on our feet again, where we're doing some collaboration, maybe with science things or, you know, content areas um, across schools in the same district. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I just want to jump to Judy. She's had her hand up. Judy Mangum, do you want to unmute yourself? Have you got a question? Uh, maybe not a question, but there's two observations. Um, one, just watching my daughter. She's in junior high right now. Um, once they start prepping AP, and uh, I don't know if this is across the board on all junior highs. I know in elementary, they have the immersion. They try to do all Chinese. And she currently had a has a teacher that comes from the elementary side, so maybe that's what's carryover, who's very insistent that they only speak Chinese in class. But um, like they're just concepts, especially AP uh, vocabularies uh, or some cultural ones that they, you know, no matter how well you're trying to explain in simple Chinese, it doesn't understand. Like there was one instance they were doing mint. And so she got the class, she's like, oh, we talked about, I'm not sure why it is, but I think it's new to you know, so it's, it's, it's you know, saving space. And, and her teacher, I used an example about going to somebody's house and asking, have you eaten or something like that. And so that solidified in her mind that it was about noodles. And so did everybody else in the class. <laughs> so this poor teacher had gone three lessons, you know, she spent three lessons on this period. And, you know, they really didn't understand what she was talking about. Um, then the other thing I was wanted to bring up was, um, I feel really bad for the teachers because the kids, when they go through summer, they lose so much of the language. And, um, and so I'm finding that the junior high teacher have to kind of go back and, you know, kind of um, revisit with the third grade vocabulary even. But the kids don't understand that, of course. And so they, they said, oh, this teacher is teaching us third grade language. And they go back to tell their parents that. And if their parents don't understand Chinese, then they start throwing the teacher under the bus, going, you know, why are you doing this to my kid? You know, but I, I, I speak Chinese, so I'm like, well, that's because you, <laughs> you lost everything in, in, back in the summer, and so did all your friends. And so that's why. So I just, I think maybe communicating with the teachers, finding a way to talk to the parents, because I, sometimes when I talk to the other parents, the parents don't understand that. They only hear it from the students. And so they have a poor reflection on the teacher thinking the teacher is not doing a job teaching them junior high level stuff. Mm -hmm. Great so. comment. And, and I, it just it leads me to a thought that's in my mind. And maybe Stacy, you have some thoughts on the more successful programs. What do you see in terms of teacher, parent, and student interactions? Um, does it, are there, is there some kind of secret sauce that you see that we as parents could be involved in to make that kind of magic work? Because, you know, I think, you know, we have really, I don't know, like strong years and feel like things are good and other years, maybe not so much. I'm just wondering in your experience here, what do you see in terms of parents, teachers and the community that makes it really go well? Maybe that's an impossible question because it's such a big well, thing. I think it's an ongoing challenge. Um, you know, I, and I think as teachers, the longer teachers stay, the better they understand um, how to make that work. Um, and then, and the type of communication culturally, I mean, it's always, it's a cultural, it's a very culturally um, challenging thing in, on what you communicate and how you communicate. 
Um, and I'm sure that every parent here has stories about um, communication with um, their child's teachers. Um, it's, it's the nature of the beast. It really is. And I am so grateful for um, all of you parents for your um, understanding and your patience and your persistence and your willingness to step into this. Um, it's a messy world of uh, cul cross-cultural communication. I mean, it's not cut and dried. And uh, so we all have to have patience uh, in that process. It's, I, I think um, frequency of communication is something that we encourage our teachers to do. Um, and many of them understandably are, are um, concerned about maybe their, my English isn't so great, you know, um, so I don't really want to write emails. Um, so that I, I think reaching out to teachers and letting them know that you're interested in communicating with them and uh, in a positive way uh, goes a long way from the parent's side and can kind of help them maybe open up a little more. We've got another question in the chat that I didn't get to before. Uh, Jean Chang Yu has written, how much emphasis is put on pronunciation in the early years of DLI Mandarin? Just a sense for the parents. Sometimes the parents don't know what their kids are doing because they're not in class, right? And so um, what kinds of things are being done for pronunciation wise in the early years? And it, it seems like listening is really important. They're hearing the teacher, which is a great thing, but. Is this an emphasis early on, or we just want the kids to get speaking? Well, uh, yeah, of course, it, it's always it's always present, and pronunciation is something that uh, is ongoing uh, for as long as you are learning and <laughs> learning another language. I'm sure you know this, Craig. I know that. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, as far as the tones, what we find with our students as second language learners, uh, there's two things to attend to. The first one are the sounds that are uh, the sounds themselves. And the second thing are the tones. That is, you know, which direction the sound is moving. The tones take a long time to develop, but it does come down to the teacher's um, uh, emphasis on that. I mean, obviously that's something we encourage beginning in first grade. They don't officially learn uh, necessarily through the curriculum, um, tone markings, uh, the symbols for those tones till third grade, but they should definitely uh, through awareness building activities be having that happen in the first and second. But you know, you have to think from the student's point of view, there's so much information coming in and when they're trying to focus on the sounds or you know, if they're trying to focus on creating a sentence or creating a, a thought and putting it into Chinese, uh, the first thing they're going to think about are the sounds, um, not the tones. Um, it kind of goes out the window when they start getting creative. So does their grammar. It's just kind of the process. So um, I would say, it's, you know, obviously ask your child's teacher um, how much emphasis they do on that. I've seen teachers do a fabulous job of that, stopping kids and saying, now what was that? And, you know, redoing it again and learning hand motions for the directions of the sound. And that would help you know. Other questions? I've got a question, but I don't want to keep, um, I don't want to monopolize. If anyone's, is, is, am I missing something that's come up in the chat? We've had some other great advice. Shari Taylor saying some great things in there. Um, and Amy mentions that elementary, they've got a team of parent volunteers that are liaisons assigned to each grade level, work with a Chinese teacher. That helps to build lines of communication. Um, I, I'll go ahead and ask, I don't want to, but I'm interested in, I'm interested to ask Stacy or Galausher, like what kinds of things, what kind of changes are you thinking about or toying with maybe over the next couple of years? Is there a certain thing? Because I know you've tried a lot of things and that's what's great about the program is we're innovative and it's new. And like you said, we're painting the airplane while we're building it. But I'm just wondering what's on your mind about what things you'd like to tinker with or is there a pilot program that you're, and it might be these, these online courses with China, which has been such a hit. What kinds of things are on your mind? What's next in the program that parents could look forward for? Or if it's a pilot, you know, what kinds of things are out there? What, um, I, just, uh, thanks, Craig. I the, Just what I began with and what I ended with, I where, where I feel um, that we need to work. I mean, we're continually fixing, not fixing, but, you know, adjusting. Um, 
We're not trying new things all the time. We sp we've developed a curriculum specifically for DLI and for our program that's now um, we're adding the last level of that this upcoming school year. So eight years um, of a spiraled curriculum all the way through from first grade to eighth grade. That's been a huge um, undertaking. Um, next year, we'll be adding in some additional pieces to the curriculum to help with differentiation and assessment as students come back. And we have uh, a lot more uh, differentiation needs um, in our amongst our students. You know, that's the curricular piece of it. But like I said, to me, it's not this program isn't about curriculum. It's about putting our preparing our kids for the world um, and what they're going to do with their language in the world. So the final slide that I had up there showed a, a number of those types of things, things to take them out of the classroom to get them using their language in other contexts, uh, whether that's going abroad or whether that's at home um, online with a camp or whether that's in the community with an internship, but broadening our interaction with our local community and the international community is where I would like to see things go. Yeah, and then for us, we keep modifying our uh, curriculum in order to update more information and we learn from our previous experiences which part is not good and which part we should uh, emphasize more so that's why we are uh, still modifying our uh, our curriculum and meanwhile just like uh, what stacy just said uh, we try to uh, make our students have a connection with the community that's why we want them to interview the uh, uh, the community uh, i mean the uh, chinese immigrants in the community in that case they can kind of reach reach out to the community and then try to learn from the people around them like their neighbors or their like previous teachers or st still keep the connections with those people so i think that's one way we can kind of build up the relations with the uh, with uh, with the community just like uh, i think just like uh, somebody mentioned that su mama so one of our uh, school i think they interviewed su mama as well so su mama was our interviewee so they kind of uh, they they also had su mama went to their classroom i, I remember it should be in our Alpine, the Orem High School. So Sumama went to give them the, the New Year activities in Orem High School. And then I think she also went to uh, Tingview High School to do that too. So I think community is our resource, learning resource. So we try to encourage that. And we also encourage our t uh, students to do some volunteer jobs in the elementary school. So some of my students went to the elementary school to, to uh, work with the teacher over there. So they kind of interview that teacher as well even though the teacher was not, you know, was not their teacher before. So that's another way. And then I think the main things we want to do is about project-based learning. So we want to create more real life projects for students to, to show their works to more audience, real audi audiences in the world. So maybe in the future, we might create some like website for students to post their works and then so they can get more feedbacks from the, the audiences in the whole world. So I think uh, that's our goal in the future. A lot of great suggestions, you know, really valuing the heritage community, finding them like in our schools and in our neighborhoods and connecting with them. Because I think a lot of times the heritage, heritage community wants to connect with the local community as well. And we can be the ones that reach out when we understand the value that they have. And it's a value to them too, to be connected. So I think those are great ideas. And that's something we can do right here at home. You know, when COVID strikes, we can't travel and it's a lot of things are shut down, but trying to find those people in our schools, and even just the teachers to make them part of the community, I think can help. So those are great ideas. Yeah. We're coming up to that's the end. Why oh, go ahead. Yes. I say that's why our program is called Breach bridge program. It's not only bridging the high school and the higher ed, but also bridging our DLI program with the community as well. So that's why that's our purpose of being bridge students. Sure. It's a beautiful closing statement, G. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think we're coming to the end. If there's one more quick question, maybe we can get it in just under the nine o'clock, but otherwise maybe we'll just close things down. I've seen great comments coming up in the chat again, you know, just um, saying that meetings like this really help to inspire us as parents. Heather's got a hand up. Can you, you got a question quick? Yeah, I was, um, uh, when, uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your Chinese name. Gaolao, <laughs> sure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, when you were talking about how you had some of your bridge students um, doing that Zoom presentation to some of the younger grades, um, that, uh, that really inspired me. And I really liked that. Is there a way that we can incorporate that throughout the whole um, DLA program here in this state. Um, Cause I would, I would even love to see that maybe like our middle school teacher um, does helps her students create a presentation that they could create um, present over zoom to our elementary school kids even, or even our high school kids would then would present to our middle school kids or to even to our elementary. I'd love to see more interaction with um, between all of the grades together. So that way our younger kids and then as they're getting older can see right. that this is where I'm going. And mm -hmm. wow, that's so cool. Look at how fluent they are and and all of that. And I just think it would grab more attention. I would just, I was just wondering if that's something that we could start to incorporate more um, in, the, in the program in general to help our younger students really get a feel for for where they're going. Definitely. Last year we started to do that. Before the pandemic, I took my students to visit the sixth grade classroom. So they kind of share what they learn from Chinese history to the sixth graders because they are learning the world history in Chinese, right? So, in, yeah. so that's why we gave them some uh, some class, like uh, each group they gave the class about the feudalism <laughs> so this is a kind of hard concept but through the students presentation the younger kids got it right away <laughs> so i think that's really good way to help the whole uh how to say the articulation among all grades together so we will encourage that through the bridge program but definitely i will encourage the teachers in the middle school to do that as well with the younger kids and then come to talk to us in the future. I, th I think, yeah. yeah, through Zoom, it's everything's possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know, and cause like Craig and I were talking earlier, um, maybe a couple months ago that I wanted to kind of pilot and start a club at our elementary school to kind of bring the school together as one instead of having a Chinese side and an English side and the kids kind of like, butt heads and everything. I want to bring them together and we're going to start a club and pilot it and have our older grades teach maybe once a month or once a week a Chinese class to the whole school, like whoever wants to come and learn Chinese and become part of the culture, um, whether it's they're teaching them a game or teaching them a sport or just anything like that or how to write one day they can learn how to write calligraphy or anything like that. And just, I wanted to to do that because I do believe that the older interactions with the younger kids is a vital role to keep our younger kids learning and also to help them um, become more interested. Because uh, when it's just a teacher teaching, of course they're like, oh yeah, it's my teacher. But when they, when they see someone, you know, that's kind of their own age, their own peers, it becomes a little bit more meaningful to them as well. So, and yeah. Just one more thing, like we're getting our first, cohort's gonna graduate from high school and they'll be into college, they'll be doing internships, maybe getting jobs related to China and they'll be able to share that with siblings and back with their schools. And then ch studying Chinese is gonna make a lot more sense when it comes into career opportunities that wouldn't be there otherwise. Right now we're talking about AP credit and college credit and learning, but when we're talking about this becoming careers and then they're able to invite other people to their company, then I think it will make a lot more sense. And we're just at the cusp of that as well. So I think we're out of time. Go ahead, Stacy. No, I was just, <laughs> I was just going to say to Heather, yeah, it's exciting when that happens. We have many schools that, for example, use like sixth graders or fourth graders to come and read with the first and second graders as well. 
I, I've always called that cross pollinization just within our program. That's what I would love to see happen just for the very reasons that you said. I know that we have some bridge. I know we have one bridge student in particular that was seen in that video, right? Who is actually being an aide um, in the first grade elementary. Um, yeah, I mean, and so to have those bridge students, because he's like, hey, I got extra time. I've already done all my, you know, courses and stuff. I have extra time. What can I do? And I'm like, hey, go be an aide anyway. So, you know, that's the wonderful kind of thing to see. I mean, that's where it can really be powerful both ways. Okay, I think we'll close this down, but thanks so much to Stacy and to Galauscher and to Jill who all came and I mean, shared so much. And I think it's exciting as parents for us to be able to get information like this and be thinking about our kids' education. So thanks so much for everyone, for the parents for showing up and let's for see sure. how we can keep moving ahead with communication and, and, and trying to build on this amazing base that we've got. I think everybody's made the point that Utah's the only state with a state or there's only one other with state level. We've got the support of the universities. It's just a great, start on a program. So thanks everyone for coming. We'll close things out now. Um, I'll work to get a link and see if I can post it onto the website link I put into the chat, um, maybe sometime tomorrow or the next day, but we'll make that available for people who weren't able to make it tonight or if they want to go back and see parts of this. But thanks all. And maybe we'd be able to get the PowerPoints if possible. We'll post those in the same place if that's an option. We'll talk after and see if those are available. But thanks so much for the great presentations and answering the questions and all the information. So thanks again and we'll close it out. So thanks for all coming and you guys have a good night. Back thanks to the kids. Thank you. <laughs> Back to the kids. She's here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, she's here. All right. Thanks. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And then Craig, I will send you my uh, slice, but without the videos. Sure, no, that's great. I thought the videos were great. It was fun to see the kids doing both Chinese and English.